The Mormon Church, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, originated during the early 1800s. A 14-year-old boy from New York named Joseph Smith claimed to have been visited by extraterrestrial beings who ordered him to organize a new religion. Despite such unlikely beginnings, Smith's followers quickly began to grow. They eventually headed west and settled in the Great Salt Lake Valley in Utah. Today, more than three quarters of Utah's population regard Joseph Smith as a prophet of God and continue to adhere to his teachings. As one of the fastest growing religions in America, the Mormon Church claims more than 10 million members worldwide and is currently the largest business corporation in the Western United States, with property holdings in all 50 states and on every continent. In spite of early church doctrines that included the practice of blood atonement, which required the death of any member who violated the will of the hierarchy, the Mormon Church has amazingly evolved into one of today's leading proponents of family values. Dr. Harold Goodman, Brigham Young University professor, former Mormon bishop, and LDS mission president. Well, the church encourages the family to be as self-sustaining as possible in their activities, starting with the family home evening, where the father, who is the patriarch of the family, would gather his family together. There they would have a prayer, an opening song or two, uh, I looked out the window and what did I see? Popcorn popping on the apricot tree. People of the Mormon church, they were all so friendly. They got me into the church through their social program, which is fabulous, and the family atmosphere, which was mine was broken up, therefore I went right to it. Despite teachings that are in direct conflict with nearly every basic Christian tenet, the Mormon Church has managed to present itself to the public as a Christian religion. In fact, the Mormon Church adds more than 350,000 converts annually to its roster, 80% of which come from Christian backgrounds. The Mormon Church has had a phenomenal growth. In the next 50 years, it will be approximated about 70 million people to 100 million people. There are many reasons why this is so. One is the vast uh, missionary program we have over the world. Most people are exposed to Mormonism through the young door-to-door -door missionaries of the Latter-day Saints. These missionaries have been instructed to use Christian terminology when proselytizing. However, most potential converts are unaware that basic Christian terms such as God, Jesus, and salvation have all been redefined by the Mormon hierarchy and have completely different meanings. The message presented by the missionary is therefore by design intentionally misleading. Good afternoon, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you about the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. Missionaries are also instructed to emphasize Mormonism's so-called family atmosphere and keep hidden its more bizarre beliefs and practices. Whenever possible, the fundamental doctrines of the Latter-day Saints are not revealed to potential converts until after they have joined the church. Regardless of its Christian veneer, the basic tenets of Mormonism are in direct conflict with biblical Christianity. The following piece of animation, based directly on actual Mormon publications, highlights these major doctrinal differences. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here, the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. 
both of Elohim's eldest sons were there, Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth, where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the star base Kola, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. After Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 A.D., the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing sacred temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods. Although there are thousands of Mormon churches throughout the world, 
there are only a few dozen Mormon temples. These massive structures play a vital role in the Mormon's quest for godhood. Mormons must engage in a series of occultic rituals inside the temple in order to become a candidate for godhood. Only an elite selection of devout Mormons are allowed to enter. To do so, the potential Mormon god must adhere to a strict code of ethics, including abstinence from tobacco or caffeine-based products, paying a full tithe to the Mormon church, and wearing of the magic Mormon underwear 24 hours a day. He has to receive a satisfactory interview from his bishop and from his stake president. There he's asked, or she has asked, certain rather penetrating questions about their worthiness, their morality. If he's a full tithe peer, that is the only way that we can be with our Heavenly Father. Otherwise, uh, we could not be in his presence. The motivation for the Mormon male to commit to such requirements is the promise of endless celestial sex with thousands of goddess wives, along with a personal planet to rule and reign over. However, Mormon males who fail to meet all of the necessary requirements risk being castrated upon their entrance to heaven. So you can see why the temple is so important to the Latter-day Saint. Because if he is worthy to go into the temple and there receive the sacred ordinances and covenants and keep them, he can eventually grow into becoming a god himself. Tell me who God the Father is to you. He is like you and I, every human being on the face of the earth. So is he a man? Yes, he is. How did he get to be God? He, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's perfect in every way. So if we are perfect, can we become like God? Yes, ma'am. In addition to the eternal marriage ceremony, Mormon initiates are required to engage in a number of occultic rites inside the temple, including a bizarre ritual known as baptism for the dead. Brother Pratt, having authority, I wash you preparatory to receiving your anointings for and in behalf of John Kimball, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Sister Bradford, I wash you preparatory to you receiving your anointings for and behalf of Eliza Barrett. Eliza Barrett, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Chuck Sackett is a former Mormon temple worker who conducted thousands of ceremonies during a nine-year period at the Los Angeles Temple in California. After entering the temple, men and women are separated. These initiates or patrons first enter a dressing area where they're instructed to remove all their clothing, which is then placed in a locker and locked with a key. Their naked bodies are covered with a poncho-like sheet called a shield. I wash your head that your brain and intellect may become clear and active. Your eyes, that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error. Your nose, that you may smell. Ceremonial washings, anointings, and blessings are then performed on each part of the body by a temple worker. And in the spine. Your breast, that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles. Your vitals and bowels, that they may be healthy and strong and perform their proper function. The initiates are then dressed in the garments of the holy priesthood, which must thereafter be worn 24 hours a day every day of the year, with certain exceptions for public athletic events and bathing. But for many devout Mormons, they are not even removed for moments of physical intimacy. It will be a shield and a protection to you against the power of the destroyer until you have finished your work on the earth. This magic underwear acts as an occultic talisman, supposedly providing the wearer with protection from satanic forces and their terrible consequences, so long as it is worn constantly and temple vows are kept. All who have entered a Mormon temple must swear a blood oath not to reveal any of the secrets they have learned under the penalty of death. The sign is made by raising the right hand. The first token of the Aaronic priesthood represents having your throat slit from ear to ear, and having your tongue torn out by its roots. The execution of the penalty is made by placing the right thumb under the left ear, drawing the thumb quickly across the throat to the right ear, and dropping the hand to the side. 
The first token of the Melchizedek priesthood represents having your belly ripped open and having your vitals and bowels gush out upon the ground. The wording has now been revised to be less offensive, yet each patron still swears an oath that rather than reveal these secret words and gestures, he would agree to be killed by the priesthood. Our living prophet has told us there are three purposes of the church. One is to proclaim the gospel that we've talked about. The other is to perfect the lives of the saints. And the third is to redeem the dead. Consequently, we're actively engaged in doing research work of names and places of birth dates of our families as well as all other mortals that we possibly can. In recent years, the Mormon Church has resorted to using their Baptism for the Dead program as a recruiting technique. They have begun targeting potential converts by telling them that they can provide salvation for their unsaved loved ones who have already died, thus deceiving vulnerable people with a false sense of hope. Ed Decker is a former high-ranking Mormon who spent 19 years in the church before having his eyes open to such anti-biblical heresies. Among the Mormon temple rituals is the practice of baptism for the dead, when their dead are called up to convert to Mormonism. During these ceremonies, many Mormons have had exhilarating and even frightening encounters with apparitions or spirit beings inside the temple. Former Mormon prophet Wilfred Woodruff admitted to being surrounded by the dead at one point while inside the temple and warned that the dead will seek out others who enter the temple. Joseph Smith was a sorcerer and practiced crystal ball gazing or fortune telling and was convicted of this practice by the New York courts. Smith's practices of magic and necromancy led him annually during a witchcraft holy day to the Hill Camorra in New York specifically to seek encounters with a spirit being called Moroni. During this time he would attempt to conjure up the spirit from the dead. There is strong evidence that in 1824, Joseph Smith actually had to dig up the body of his dead brother Alvin and bring part of that body with him to the Hill Cumorah in order to gain access to the gold plates on which were written the Book of Mormon. After his death, Smith was found to be carrying a magic talisman on his person, sacred to Jupiter, designed to bring him wealth, power, and success in seducing women. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Bible warns against participation in all witchcraft-related practices, since they can lead to spiritual deception and a rejection of the truth. There shall not be found among you anyone who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. John Heinerman director of the Anthropological Research Center in Salt Lake City is an active and devout Mormon who candidly admits to the Latter-day Saints involvement in occultism. I as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints am somewhat active in what is called the New Age Movement. The New Age Movement consisting of uh, things like uh, crystal gazing, channeling, pyramid power and so forth and so on. People of the New Age Movement are often more open to the truths of Mormonism, like the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith working with the Urim and Thummim, than conservative Christian folks who are mostly closed-minded to these things. Although claiming to be a Christian religion, the Mormon Church does not display any crosses on any of its properties. However, the inverted pentagram, which is known to be the highest satanic symbol, is featured extensively on Mormon temples and other church structures. For those who may find it hard to believe that Mormonism has more in common with Satanism than Christianity, one need only look at the third chapter of Genesis, where it is Satan himself who promises godhood to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Many Mormons are persuaded that their beliefs are in unity with biblical doctrine, but the reality is that the Bible is not their rod of truth, for their leaders deny its authority and hold their own writings and statements in higher esteem. While they claim that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, it has undergone numerous revisions and changes since its original edition over 160 years ago. In fact, one researcher counted over 4,000 changes. Near the end of his life, Joseph Smith insisted there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. Yet to date, 
Mormon leaders have altered, dismissed, and covered up thousands of historical and archaeological errors, false prophecies, and doctrinal contradictions. The foundation of the Mormon religion is Joseph Smith's so-called first vision, where as a young boy, he was commanded by extraterrestrial beings to organize the Mormon church. Yet there are nine different contradictory versions of this event that have been chronicled by Mormon historians. Mormon leaders are deliberately keeping from you the true history of their religion because they know you will have a hard time believing it's from God if you saw how it really was all put together. In the unpublished accounts, we find that Joseph Smith first said it was just Jesus that appeared to him. The second time he wrote a story down, a few years later, he says, many angels appeared to him. Then some years later, he says that two beings appeared. He changes the date, he changes how old he is, he changes the motivation, why he went into the woods to pray, he changes who was there, and he changes what the message was that they gave him. So if he were uh, giving us an actual account of a real experience, we would assume he would have known the first time around whether it was God or Jesus, if it was both of them, what their message was and when it happened. Yet we find him redrafting this story. Well, if you were a witness of an accident and someone asked you to tell about it, if you gave three accounts as divergent as those three are, people would say you couldn't have witnessed the event. And there are so many things in the church records, if they were open for public inspection, it would tarnish this beautiful image that the church puts out the missionary comes to your door. We have a beautiful story to tell you about families, and they want to tell you what a glorious place this is to raise your children. Uh, the missionary isn't part of the cover-up. He doesn't know this. He has been told that everything will check out. It's all 100% true. He thinks the records are open. He doesn't even realize he couldn't go to Salt Lake and see these documents for himself. The leaders have to go back and rework, rewrite, cover up, change, delete, add, all the way through on uh, all of their books, their history, their scriptures, uh, they suppress their diaries because these things show the uh, confusion and the um, man-made nature of the theology and the religion. The Book of Mormon claims to be an actual historical record translated from real plates that Joseph Smith unearthed in a hill in New York. Now, if this is a genuine history, one would assume you could study this just like you would study any historical book. As we look at the Book of Mormon, we find an entirely different story. Instead of being an actual record of actual fact, I have looked over maps, checked uh, archaeological information, and I still am left to wonder, where is the land of Zarahemla? Where is the Valley of Nimrod? Where are the plains of Nephaha? I have been unable to find a record of even one city as mentioned in the Book of Mormon. We turn to the Book of Mormon, we have nothing. There is no Nephite language, there are no Nephite cities. There is not a map in any Book of Mormon. You cannot locate any site. There is no evidence for the book, and yet it's supposed to be a historical record. We have never excavated one single artifact that even remotely relates to this alleged civilization that the Mormons claim existed in the United States, Central America, and in South America. Many people do not understand the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is a history of the uh, people that inhabited the American continent, North, South, and Central America, from about 600 B.C. till about 420 A.D. And we have uh, much evidence, of course. Despite claims to the contrary, decades of searching by Mormon archaeologists have failed to uncover one piece of evidence validating the Book of Mormon as a historical record. Yet in the last hundred years, more than 25,000 archaeological digs have unearthed evidence validating the Bible as an accurate record of history. One of the Mormon Church's standard works of scripture is called the Pearl of Great Price. In this is the Book of Abraham that Joseph Smith claimed was translated from some papyrus fragments that he purchased from an e Egyptologist traveling through the area. And by 1842, with no knowledge of the Egyptian language, he translated that into what is called the Book of Abraham. That manuscript disappeared until 1967. It has now resurfaced. Several famous Egyptologists have now looked at it, translated it, 
and have found that it doesn't have anything to do with the time of Abraham at all. Joseph Smith did not get right even one word in this whole translation. In fact, he took one little letter that looks like a backwards E and translated it into over 76 words with seven names. Joseph Smith used the doctrine of divine revelation to legitimize the taking of many wives and spiritualized it as an essential doctrine of his Mormon religion. In addition to his first wife, Emma, Smith appears to have actively enjoyed at least 27 other wives, many of whom were already married. His first plural wife was a barely pubescent teenage relative who was living in their home at the time. Polygamy became a standard requirement of Mormonism necessary for entrance into the highest level of heaven, referred to by Mormons as the celestial kingdom. Brigham Young, successor to Joseph Smith and second prophet of the Mormon church, vigorously proclaimed that the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Mormon scripture still says that those who abide not in this doctrine shall be damned. In 1890, government pressure forced the Mormon church to reevaluate this divine commandment. The confusion and anger that resulted from this undermining of the validity of a non-revocable eternal commandment resulted in the formation of many offshoots of Mormonism. Generally known as fundamentalists, these groups openly practice polygamy today and hold to the teachings of the first two prophets. We were raised with the basic tenets of Mormonism, including polygamy. That is what was openly and freely practiced uh, in our community. Well, my great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was a polygamist. He served under Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He had 19 wives and 64 children so that he could become a god as God is now. He really believed that God and Jesus are polygamists and that every Mormon man would have to have a lot of wives. My father had a total of 11 wives. We were very sincere about uh, all the aspects of Mormonism. Uh, we used the Book of Mormon as one of our main sources of uh, knowledge. Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the Mormon scriptures, say that you must have plurality of wives. It is a requirement in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It is clearly stated that uh, if we are to attain the highest degree of glory, that we uh, must do the works of Abraham. Therefore, we were taught that in order to attain the celestial glory, uh, a man must take more than one wife. There's also the warning that any person who will not believe this and enter into polygamous temple marriages, they shall be destroyed. So the pressure was on always for men to um, marry several women. That was one of the prerequisites to uh, godhood. I was in the Mormon church for 11 years, never missed my tithing once. I had a temple recommend. And then the Lord showed me how that they had departed from the original track that Joseph and Brigham had set it out on. They passed a law that a man could only have one wife, and actually uh, it's, the, it's the order of heaven for a man to have more than one wife. Are you involved in fertile marriage now? Yeah. The youngest girls uh, were reserved exclusively for the older men that would have a harder time securing more wives. So that's how they worked it. And my father, um, he, he got most of his wives by bribing other men with his daughters. <laughs> I was one of the ones that refused to fall into that, and I chose my own husband and uh, married and had a very loving relationship for 15 years and, uh, until I lost them through this blood atonement process. blood atonement teaches that there are some sins that God cannot forgive by the works of Calvary and therefore the sinner must have his own blood spilled. This blasphemous doctrine not only diminishes the power and the purpose of Christ's blood but glorifies the atoning power of the blood of the Mormon sinner. While steadfastly observed by Mormon fundamentalists 
This anti-Christian principle originated with Joseph Smith and was furthered by later Mormon prophets. This troublesome doctrine of blood atonement blemishes the wholesome public image required by Mormonism's leaders. Today, the brethren in Salt Lake City still grapple over the predicament they find themselves in when having to both affirm and deny blood atonement. For example, the late Mormon apostle Bruce R. McConkie, in his book Mormon Doctrine, denied that the church ever practiced or taught blood atonement. Yet on the same page, stated that because the blood of Christ is not sufficient to forgive certain sins, the Mormon God requires man to have his own blood spilled. On the 27th of June, we were carrying on our life as usual and um, happened to be the 144th anniversary of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. My half-brothers came into our office in Houston, Texas and murdered my husband. At the same time, there were three other consecutive deaths uh, going on. My brother-in-law, Duane, and his daughter, eight-year-old daughter, Jenny, was with him, and they also killed her. Our names were on the list of, uh, to be atoned for. Uh, my father uh, believed that we were traitors to God's cause and that our blood must be shed to atone for the sin of uh, turning against light and knowledge, as he supposed. Blood atonement is if you have charity enough uh, for uh, someone to save them, uh, the shedding of their blood is the only way that they can atone for certain sins. People really thought they were doing a favor in my great-grandfather's day to shed the blood, save their soul, and it's still taking place today. My great-grandfather John D. Lee was one of the Mormon men who were called avenging angels or destroying angels. It was their duty, their obligation, to cut the throats, shed the blood of people who were apostate Mormons, who were, who were guilty of speaking against uh, the authorities. Jesus shed his blood that, uh, as an infinite sacrifice, but there are some sins that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for, and there it therefore it requires the shedding of uh, that man's blood to atone for adultery, for apostasy, for marriage to a Negro, for not receiving the gospel, for lying, for any of the other offenses. They'd have to have their own bloodshed to have forgiveness of sin. To put it simply, my father's beliefs stem directly from Mormonism. Not one, not one thing is different than what the Mormon, early Mormon doctrine is. The original doctrine that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught is exactly what I believe. I'm now at present baptizing people and I have five apostles now and we're out uh, teaching and, and preaching the gospel, trying to get the Mormons into the original uh, doctrine that Brigham and Joseph had it set on. And I refuse to give it up. That's the reason why today people are still killing each other, shedding the blood so they can have forgiveness of sin. And it comes directly from Joseph Smith and from Brigham Young, the first two prophets of Mormonism. I would just like uh, you to know that uh, if anything happens to me ever or to my children, I will uh, personally, uh, I believe the Mormon church in general will be responsible because the very doctrine of blood atonement stems from Mormonism. In just over 160 years, the Mormon Church has become one of the world's most powerful financial institutions. Literally billions of dollars a year are received from its faithful members in the forms of tithes. One conservative guess is that $15 million a day is harvested from Mormons worldwide, with over half that from Mormons in America alone. In addition, the Mormon Church generates more than $6 billion yearly through its many business enterprises and subsidiaries. This income places them among the world's wealthiest corporations. The LDS land holdings in central Florida alone outsize Disney World by 10 to 1. Both business and church assets are shrewdly funneled through several holding companies controlled by a corporate power base known as the General Authorities or the Brethren. 
Although elevated to the office of spiritual leaders, the majority of these men had been successful businessmen before they were called by revelation to join the LDS hierarchy. Church members, including those in lower levels of leadership, who have faithfully and sacrificially contributed their tithes, time and energy, are powerless to call for an accounting. I have always been fascinated with the great wealth and power that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints wields nationally and internationally. With all the research that we have done, the figure is close to 11 and a half to 12 billion dollars worldwide, all of their investments and holdings. One thing that I was amazed at was that the LDS Church rolls over every year between one and a half and two and a half billion dollars just in its investment portfolio and that. They're into everything from uh, uh, agricultural futures like soybeans, uh, pork bellies. Someone I talked with from the finance department some years ago said, when we make investments, we don't pray to God and we don't go by revelation. We do it just like the world does. The church has been fortunate to have a number of its people in prominent positions around the country in political authority and that. Uh, senators, congressmen, uh, people in the CIA and the FBI, and at times the church has called upon them to go and do a favor for the church, get the church out of a jam, or use their political clout in behalf of the church. Most people do not realize the full extent and power of the LDS church. Someone I talked with said, we can get anything we want on anyone we want at any time we want. The kind of impression Mormons want to be associated with is the epitome of all that is wholesome. Yet the happy family facade in Mormon-filled Utah is disintegrating rapidly according to recent national statistics. The number one reason that the church excommunicates is for adultery and its numbers are staggering and increasing every year. Another area of concern is the rising amount of child abuse within the LDS church. In a state monopolized by a religious group that advertises marital harmony, Utah's divorce rate is higher than the national average. 55,000 women are abused annually by their partners. Child abuse and neglect has increased 212 percent in the last decade, with over 10,000 new cases last year alone. Rape and sexual assault for adults has increased 93 percent during the same period. There has been a staggering 379 percent increase in child sexual abuse to children under 14. Much of the abuse is incestuous and sadly the perpetrators are given lenient sentences because of an oddity in Utah law which accommodates sexual abuse by a Mormon relative. Utah has a higher than the national average rate of divorce. It has higher than the national average rate of suicide especially teen suicide is much higher in Utah than it is nationally. This is partly due to the fact that Mormons emphasize perfection. And so many of these young people feel defeated in their striving for godhood. They can't measure up to everything the church is asking of them. And it just so demolishes their self-esteem that they can't go on, and so then they take their life. Once I got into the church, I was asking questions, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't Christian, as they had told my mom and myself. It just wasn't right. There are many people in the Mormon church that are having trouble believing it, many that are in it that don't really believe it at all. Mormonism undercuts the Bible. It undercuts all the other churches, so that the Mormon that starts to lose faith in Mormonism will usually feel there's nothing out there to look into. The biggest danger was that they took me in, and I was thinking it was a Christian church. And it wasn't a Christian church, it was a cult. Today, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints continues to spend tens of millions of dollars annually on television, radio, and print media campaigns designed to make the Mormon church appear to be Christian. Discerning seekers of truth must realize, however, that this claim to be Christian is not reflected in their teachings. Anyone that believes in Christ is a Christian. And we believe that we are Christians uh, above all other denominations because we have so much revealed information about our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. The Mormon hierarchy boasts that they are Christians above all others because of their additional scriptures. 
even going so far as to label the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ. Yet the Bible clearly states in Galatians 1.9 that if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Joining the Mormon Church will result in a lifetime of bondage to a program of man-made works with no certainty of salvation. Since Mormons believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus was not sufficient enough to pay for their sins, works have been added. However, as the Bible records in Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. During this program, you have learned about the beliefs of Mormonism and have discovered these beliefs to be in direct opposition to the Word of God. In contrast to the confusion of Mormonism, the real truth of biblical Christianity is very simple. And here it is. If you wish to spend eternity in heaven, you can, by simply praying and believing the following. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross and shed your blood for my sins. You were buried, you rose again, and you ascended into heaven. I invite you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and save my soul. I believe by faith that you can and will save me. Thank you, Jesus, for your gift of eternal life.